is from is from the professors in Strathclyde University in Glasgow of uh, the urban planning uh, department. Uh, oh. It discusses theory about um, how uh, to design cities and respond to changes through time. And it gives a very practical information on like how to design cities and street networks and adapt to changes. It's a really cool book. Oh, that's very nice. Uh, wow. And it's even nicer you could show the, the cover, right? Um, Undoing Optimizations by Alison Power. Wow, that's uh, interesting. The culture map. Oh, I read the culture map. Ah, Anna. <laughs> it's Anna. Uh, um, invisible Women Exposing Data Bias in a World Designed by Men. Wow, this is a very good one. It's so about just data. <laughs> Hi from Poland. The eyes of the skin, Yuhani Palazma. Ah, never heard about that one. From what is to what if, Rob Hopkins. The Just City by Susan Feinstein. Very good. Culture map I've read. Cities for people. Guys, you don't have to put only urban planning uh, books. You can say any books you've been reading. Sapiens. Wow, these books by Yuval Noah Harari are super nice. Human Metropolis. Towards the city of thresholds. All right, time is flying. Oh my God, and we are already three minutes in. Uh, without further ado, um, Welcome everyone to the third session of our uh, autumn school planning and design for the just transition. Uh, we have had two sessions so far. The first one was about uh, just resilience. And the second one was about um, just data in which we uh, really try to discuss where data comes from, uh, who produces data, what is being used for, and so on, right? And there was a very good critique on the uh, idea of smart cities, which I think we all should really think about what smart cities really mean uh, in the world of today. Uh, continuing with our uh, just series, we are going to talk today about just space. And uh, today we have a very special guest, also organizer of this event, Caroline Newton. Caroline is a, a associate professor of spatial planning and strategy. And I know that because that's uh, exactly what I am as well. Uh, so we have the same title at uh, the Department of Urbanism at TU Delft, right? We have a very big, uh, School of Architecture in Delft, and this uh, School of Architecture has several departments. We work in the Department of Urbanism, and uh, we organize uh, a lot of courses. Um, maybe, um, maybe later, Caroline is going to talk to you about the MOOCs that she is leading. There are online courses that are super, super nice. The objective today is to talk about uh, spatial justice. So Caroline is going to give her lecture. I am going to give a very short lecture afterwards just to complement a few thoughts. But meanwhile, please let us know what books you were reading. Uh, they don't have to be only, only uh, books about planning. They could be plenty, uh, you know, books about anything. But without further ado, and uh, we have 109 people in the room right now, I'll leave the floor to my colleague, uh, Caroline Newton. Caroline, the floor is yours. Thank you, Roberto. And thank you for mentioning uh, the MOOCs. I've put already one, uh, one in, in the chat, which is the MOOC Rethink the City, which is part of a bigger program of uh, three MOOCs that uh, work on similar yet a bit different topics. And I've also put the uh, link to the other one or to the full certificate in the chat. I'm more than happy to answer questions if there would be some. 
but um, I'll share my screen. Okay, let's see if this works. Yes. Okay, uh, do you see the presentation or the notes? Uh, we will see the presentation. Okay, great, <laughs> good. So, um, yeah, what, what I uh, want to do tonight is just mention a few points that I think are important to think about when we want to discuss issues of spatial justice and injustice. And I want to start with this idea of the American dream. And I guess you you have some idea of, of what it is. So I, if someone wants to shout, uh, what is the American dream, you're, you're welcome to. If, if not, then uh, I'll, I'll continue and, and uh, you can um, sort of give your own opinion uh, afterwards. But so the, the idea or the term of the American dream is, uh, it was first used in a book uh, that I've put there by James uh, Truslow Adams, who's a writer and an historian. And it was published in 1931. The book was called The Epic of America. And for him, the American dream is the dream of a land in which life should be better and richer and fuller for everyone. It's a dream of social order in which each man and each woman shall be able to attain to the fullest stature of which they are inattainable capable. That's a, a quote from the book and be recognized by others for what they are regardless of their fortuitous circumstances or of birth or position. So, Although Adams is actually looking for values and a good quality of life, he also saw, saw that quite rapidly the, the idea eroded. And so today we often see that the, when we talk about the American dream, it is believed that anyone, regardless of where they were born or what class they were born into, they can attain their own version of success. And, and very often success is being sort of uh, uh, used as a, as a synonym for being very wealthy. And that in a society where upward mobility is possible for everyone. And so the American dream is achieved through sacrifice, through, through risk taking, and very importantly, through hard work rather than by chance. Of course, uh, I think we all know that this idea of the American dream is at least a bit naive, at least. <laughs> uh, because we know that conditions in which we are born and raised do make a difference and that these conditions are sometimes able to give you a head start in life, while they can also drastically limit your possibilities. And that is why it's so important to talk about spatial justice or to talk about space in relation to justice. So before we dive deeper into the concept, I just want to highlight that most of the things I will talk about tonight are based on the work of Edward Soja, a postmodern critical political geographer and an urban theorist. He critically analyzes space in its relation to the social world, and he tries to understand the spatiality of justice and injustice. He does so not merely because of a theoretical interest, but also in order to feed activ activism and to see how this uh, can support social change. So Socha reminds us that inequalities have always been intrinsically related to space. We all know that cities grew by rivers or at crossroads, and they didn't suddenly appear in the middle of a desert or a forest. Those specific variables linked with the location's geography determine whether that location has greater or, or less uh, development potential. So in the, in the social science, uh, we have observed what we call a spatial turn. And the spatial turn is actually a paradigm shift that occurred in the late 1980s. It then became increasingly clear that being human is not only defined by time, like we are born, we uh, live and we grow old, we eventually die, but also a spatial thing. Until the second half of the 19th century, space was merely a canvas, a container in which we as humans were active. But today we really acknowledge that space is no longer just conceptualized as this container, but space is a social construct. I will come back to that later. 
And I've put some names there uh, of some authors like uh, Foucault, Michel Foucault and uh, Peter Stoterdijk. And these authors amongst others have argued that more than before we are living in an age where space is actually overtaking time as a sense-making category. During modernism, time was the central element. Today, in let's say a, a postmodern world, it has become an accessory to space. The centrality of space as an organizing element is clear in the wide availability of concepts to speak about spatial relations, from Deleuze Rizom to Spivak's margin and center. And following uh, Lefebvre and Foucault, Socha argues that space is the third ontological category next to the temporal and the social. Um, today, when we are really experiencing things like social distancing, we can physically experience that all human activities are really taking place and very literally occur in particular places and spaces. And what we also observe is that very often they tend to cluster and they seek proximity. And, and that, is, that is crucial when we are going to discuss uh, issues of spatial justice and injustice. So depending on where you are, for example, when you have to spend uh, or when you have to stay in a quarantine, the experience can be very boring, very difficult, or maybe enjoyable. If you can sit in a nice garden um, and, and just relax and sit there and, and wait until your quarantine period is over. So this is a very practical experience uh, of, of uh, the effects of, of uh, spatial inequalities. So. I already mentioned this uh, importance of, of thinking of speci speciality as an ontological uh, category and being not as people, not only social beings or temporal beings, but really also spatial beings. And that sort of urges us to think uh, or to apply a critical perspective that helps better to understand how cities are uh, currently and also in the past have been uh, developing in a very sort of unequal way. And I, I already mentioned uh, this social production of space. So it's really uh, important to understand that uh, space is not this objective uh, container. And um, to ex elaborate a bit on that and to try to explain that, I want to use the work of uh, um, Lefebvre. And in 1974, I think I put it here. Um, uh, no, that's another one. But uh, in 1974, he writes the uh, La production de l'espace or the production of space. And he argues that space is a very complex social construction. As I said, not something abstract, not something neutral. And I think that Lefebvre's approach is really a very good uh, framework to understand how uh, space is, is a complex thing to understand. And I want to point to the, the little um, three circles that are um, intertwined. And so Lefebvre says, you have to understand space in a, in a triad, space as conceived space, as perceived space, and as lived space. And I'll briefly explain what is meant with conceived space. With, and with all three, but uh, conceived space there, you see uh, the little map there is uh, the extension plan of, uh, of Amsterdam. And it's a map that when we are working as planners or architects, we immediately understand what is, what is going on. We see, even when it's so small, you see red areas, you see green areas, you know that these red areas are the living spaces, the green um, are uh, open uh, spaces. So these conceived spaces, Lefebvre explains, are those spaces that have been des designed, let's say, or that have been created by, by professionals, by experts, by people like, like us, planners, architects. And so in the representation of space, in how they represent these spaces, they also sort of uh, exert their, their knowledge and their expertise. So the, the kind of space that is produced from this perspective is very often technical and very often difficult to understand for ordinary people. And more than sort of explaining space as something neutral, which 
is often thought of, if, if, if people talk about a map, they often present it as something neutral. Here is the map of the city and, and it shows where everything is, but it is not neutral. It is infused with the, the knowledge and the views and the ideas of the people who made it. And we can uh, ex explore that uh, further. Uh, so just one thing, uh, 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 are, uh, are the maps supposed to pop up or? No. Uh, no, 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 okay, okay. No. Um, <laughs> no that's fine. Uh, yeah, I, I'm just spending a lot of time <laughs> uh, on this. Uh, because I also want to talk about the other two categories, the perceived and the lift space. And with the perceived space, the fair means it's sort of uh, the spatial practice of people um, depending on the kind of spatial organization, the morphology of the, of the space, the physicality of space, the material design of, of, of the uh, elements, they impact how people can use the space. If, if, uh, if you live in a, a development with all roads that, that have uh, dead ends, yeah, you will not easily be able to crisscross the development. You'll always have to follow the pathways. And then thirdly, and for me a quite interesting one is the lift, uh, uh, the lift space. And what uh, Lefebvre means with the lift space are actually those uh, spaces, although very real and very material, they are also um, sort of infused with meaning that people give uh, to them with certain Im imaginaries and emotions and experiences and so on. So it's important to understand, to have a full understanding of space, to look at it from all these different perspectives. And that will help you to have a better understanding of how people make sense of their surroundings. Um, so I, I think that it's a way to try to um, also understand different ways of how injustices play out. As a planner, you can design certain things and uh, regulations for the development of certain areas, but also in the very practical everyday experience, space can create opportunities or limit, of, uh, limit uh, possibilities. So in essence, space uh, matters on, on different scales. And so I'll prob I have probably been talking a bit in an abstract sense, so let's try to make it more concrete and use an example. Um, so all of these maps show the percentages of people who live in extreme poverty. And we can start at a, at a global scale, and then you will see uh, that uh, in, in, this, uh, in this map, especially uh, the African continent sort of is prominently uh, there. And that in, in Europe, it, it all looks uh, quite good. Uh, very little people living in extreme uh, poverty. And then you can zoom in and you can take a closer look at a different scale, at the scale of Europe. And then it, you see already some, some nuances. And you see, for example, that the Netherlands, it seems to be a very a place with 0% um, poverty. And then you zoom into the Netherlands and then you see that again, there are pockets that are uh, uh, jumping out and then you zoom to Rotterdam, to the city. And there again, you see that there are pockets where there is um, extreme poverty. So what, what you see uh, rising are uh, patterns of, of inequality. And these patterns are closely linked to injustices that are uh, embedded in space or as consequences of the unequal this spatial distribution of resources or the uneven access to these resources. So let's use uh, an example again. Um, and what you see there is, a, is an image of, uh, or a map of the city of, uh, of Cape Town, um, where you, where you see that there is a concentration of, of poverty and unemployment of crime of poor services in what is called the Cape Flats area, which as you probably all know, under uh, the apartheid regime in South Africa, different population groups were uh, uh, divided and, and, and also spatially segregated according to, to color. Uh, 
Um, so if you were white, you were, would live somewhere else than if you would be black or if you would be colored. Um, and very importantly, and a point I want to stress, uh, and I will probably stress again later, is that once you sort of anchor certain things in space, it's very difficult to change. So the apartheid regime um, that lasted until 1994, they deliberately segregated people across the country, but also within the cities. And how did they do that? On the, uh, the bottom image, it's, it's just a picture and you see a road and you see a railway and you also see two uh, neighborhoods on each side of this railroad and this road. And those are one of the areas is uh, a white middle class area. The other area is a colored, uh, a colored area. And so in order to make sure that people did not meet, you put very strong infrastructure in between. You put a road and you put a railway and to make the railway safe, you put fences. So you, you, you sort of spatially embed uh, an infrastructure that is made to segregate uh, people. And of course, the, the example of South Africa is, is uh, very extreme, but you also see it in, of course, in, in other places uh, where uh, people are segregated in, in space. Uh, and if you live in certain uh, different areas, of course, uh, you have access to certain resources or you don't have access to other uh, resources. So um, when we talk about spatial justice or spatial injustice, a first important aspect is this distributional one. Um, if you want to achieve a more spatially just city, so we, we will need to think about this distribution, the distribution of opportunities and resources, but also the possibilities to access them. And of course, that is one aspect, but thinking about the distribution alone is, is not enough. We also need to think about the processes that are underlying certain spatial outcomes. So what I, what I mean here is that we need to think of how the design and the planning process has been shaped. Who has been included? Whose concerns have been addressed? Um, and, uh, and understanding these underlying processes, especially afterwards, is, is uh, often very diff difficult. But I think it's, it's important to expose these kind of uh, um, unjust practices. And most familiar shaping forces um, of, of locational and spatial discrimination will probably uh, immediately understand its, its class, its race uh, and, and gender, for example. So um, we see that in, in our urban systems, a lot of decision-making often happens in a way that it's beneficial for the already stronger groups, while the poor or the already fragile groups are often unequally affected by the policy measures. And a, an easy example is, is the, the corona measures, I think, wherever we, we are at the moment, so wherever we live, we, we know that the measures that were implemented by governments have been uh, affecting the more fragile people uh, unequally um, uh, strong, let's say. And spatial planning um, is, is a field that, unfortunately has been um, really evolved into a neoliberal practice, uh, often focusing on enabling development, enabling investments and so on. So um, city use large scale redevelopment, neighborhood upgrading, iconic architecture uh, to compete with other cities to attract international companies, more investors and high income residents. So our space very often has become nothing more than a product. And the value of that product is influenced by its location. It's expressed in money and determining the possibilities uh, for future developments. Other characteristics such as air quality, noise or smell are intrinsically linked to these locations and often enforce the attached value. 
Those living in the more affluent urban neighborhoods often enjoy less nuisance from noise or smell or better air quality and have better access to services. The more fragile and vulnerable groups, for example, of homeless or urban poor have to settle in unhealthy areas that suffer from sensorial disadvantages uh, amongst other disadvantages. And these conditions affect the physical and mental health of already vulnerable population groups. Edward Soja has explained that being differently located in space can have deeply oppressive and exploitative effects, especially when maintained over longer periods of time and rooted in per persistent divisions in society, such as those based on race, class, and gender. The additional effect of these unjust embodied experience impact vulnerable groups' possible emancipation. Also, they influence the city's livability and the attractiveness of urban life as a whole. Today, in a, in a time when cities are still looked at as sort of the, the um, solutions for all ills of climate change, for example, and we, we all go and live in cities much denser, we preserve open spaces, for example, to give an, a sort of uh, an, an easy uh, example, um, shows that it, it's really important to to think about how we are going to, if this is going to be the solution, then how are we going to organize this in such a way that it can provide a good life for all. And I think it's really important that if we want to move forward as a society, we move forward with everyone. We, we, we don't only move forward with the strong and the rich. Thus, what, what we need is a city that is able to create opportunities for all these groups, for all the in inhabitants. And if we want to do that, we, um, we need engaged professionals who use spatial justice intentionally as a leverage to transition towards a just society. So that means that we need to understand what spatial justice is. We need to understand that spatial justice involves a fair and equitable distribution in space of socially valued resources and the opportunities to use them. We have to acknowledge that social processes shape the spatiality of specific ge uh, geographies of justice or injustice, and that spatial justice needs urban dwellers to be able to participate openly and fairly in all the processes um, producing urban space. And I think that when we use spatial justice intentionally as a leverage to a transition uh, to this uh, just city, that we stand a chance. And why do I think that is? Because as I said, once a certain organization is embedded in, in, in space, it's difficult to change it. But the other way around, it also means that if we are aware of this fact that you have spatial iner inertia and we intentionally work with this, we can also embed opportunities in space. So therefore, instead of going along with developers and uh, investors and their dreams and demands, I think that's personally, it's our mor moral duty to examine how our spatial interventions can also create opportunities for all people to appropriate the city in an integrated way. And that's where I want to uh, finish my talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caroline. I I got a bit uh, uh, I got a bit enthusiastic about sharing the, uh, my books, and I think I uh, I was taking a little bit of the attention to your presentation in a way. So I apologize for that. Uh, no <laughs> but um, here we are. Um, I think a few highlights that I would like to give. Uh, based on your presentation is the fact that this paradigm shift, I hope everybody understands uh, what a paradigm shift is, right? We have a paradigm, an ensemble of ideas uh, that guide our actions. And this ensemble of ideas is shifting towards space and understanding that space really matters uh, for how people uh, access um, justice and rights, right? Uh, do I interpret it correctly, Caroline? Yes, um, but it, it's also the, the case that uh, 
in for example in philosophy you will you will find a lot of uh, authors or books that that talk about how life is 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 something that is very strongly related with time and so they think about our life and the afterlife and and the temporality but there has been a shift to really stressing that uh, we are not only temporal beings we are really spatial beings and it's these relations in space these relations be between people we, it's it's spatial we are embodied uh, beings that relate to each other in space and and of course we are now in this kind of virtual uh, space but we're still relating and and those those spaces matter when we if if we ask where is everyone from where are you that's a very special thing to ask we could also ask how old is everyone but we don't we we ask where are you so the, there is this shift towards uh, understanding how important space and space is in order what we we need space to understand what we are as humans so carla is saying that when land has value so when when uh, land is commodified it's hard to see fairness in city production what do you think about that so can we have fairness in a capitalist system you ask me yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. I think it's, uh, I, I think a lot of things, but um, <laughs> I, I think there are small cracks that we need to make use of mm -hmm. and that we need to um, appropriate and use those to, to push and to, um, uh, I think it will be very difficult if you want to do it sort of okay from now on we're go we're going to do change the way uh, space is planned and designed and who can have a say. There there are changes happening definitely, but I think we also need to push it from the um, from the cracks and 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 even within uh, let's call it uh, capitalist developments we'll have to make sure that we try to um, almost sneak in opportunities and and, uh, and an important thing to do that I think is not to try to design everything, mm -hmm. not to, to over design, but to leave room for, for appropriation, uh, leave things that are unplanned so that people can appropriate it. And, and, and uh, um, but of course, I also think next to that, it, it's needed to have some um, policy changes. And I, I think that requires a lot of political role. In For example, in Belgium, a couple of years ago, um, there was a, a law that when you develop more than, let's say 20 housing units, X percent needs to be social housing units. And of course, developers, they went crazy. They said, oh, that's not possible and blah, blah, blah. And they, found all solutions not to not to have to implement this but some projects were implemented in that way unfortunately after some time uh the, the they took it to court and so the law was um mm -hmm. how do you say it they, the, well, the well that's funny because here in the netherlands um uh you can't have any development and I, i'm sure that will surprise quite a few people but in the netherlands you can't have any development without uh affordable housing and generally, it's thirty percent of the housing units have to be affordable housing, uh, and in in Amsterdam, it's forty percent, because they really are uh, suffering with gentrification over there. Yeah. Uh, maybe something that needs to be said is that uh, commodification of land happens in different ways in different parts of the world, right? Um, in in Ethiopia, for example, all land belongs to the government and it's leased. In China, the same. Uh, in the Netherlands, we have a mixed uh, regime. So some land belongs to the government, the other is um, private. Uh, Carla, I know uh, you have a very Brazilian name, so I, I'm uh, guessing you are Brazilian. And in Brazil, that's a very big uh, issue because Brazil has lots of private land, right? Um, OK, any, any other questions, guys? It's time for questions.
Um, so, so Kuncharya says, would you say that the letter of citizen participation from Sherry Arnstein, um, from 19, uh, she, she designed the letter of citizen participation in 1969, huh? is a fundamental part of achieving just space. Caroline, what do you think? I, I, when I think participation is needed, yes. Um, but I think essentially it depends on what you understand under participation and how you de uh, define it. Uh, you have her letter, so you 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 know that uh, when it's only used just to tick a box in a development project, I think it, it doesn't work, then you might as well not have participation. Um, but true participation is really engaging people from the start. Also being aware that, of course, there are limitations to why, would, why people uh, uh, join these kind of uh, processes. I think the work of Jeremy Till is really super relevant in this. He, uh, he has a very good take on, the, um, on, on sort of the limits of participation and the role of, the, um, of also uh, architects, designers, and so in, in the whole process. So I, I really uh, would suggest you to, uh, to take a look at uh, his website. He almost all his reading is uh, freely available on his website. And if you go to other writing, I think you can even select, uh, okay, give me only things about participation. Uh -huh. And I'm, yeah. yeah, go on, sorry. No, I, I think it's important the, this, uh, that, he, that he stresses that um, you have to acknowledge on the one hand that citizens are, are the experts in their own, uh, what, what they need and in their own life. But at the other hand, as a designer, you're also a, a citizen. And as a citizen, you also have certain uh, ways of looking at the world or understanding needs. So he makes this very nice, um, it's not a comparison, but he, he builds this very nice argument of how uh, citizens are experts, but experts are also citizens. What I, uh, what I also would like to highlight is that for uh, people in this room, so we are at uh, 100, almost 130 people at the moment, and I'm seeing lots of people from Africa in the chat and a lot of people from the Middle East, from Latin America, and so on, and also from Poland, I can see Carol uh, Carolina. Oh, Carissa is there as well. Oh, lots of people that I actually know from other. Uh, when you hear the word participation, maybe you imagine different things. And I think from, from we have to kind of uh, uh, acknowledge that participation is not very common in some countries, right? Uh, in Western Europe, uh, also to some extent in Latin America and in the United States, participation means uh, engaging citizens uh, for understanding their needs, but also their, their wishes and so on. And there are several uh, ways of engaging citizens and several um, intensities of engagement, right? So, um, what Arnstein, uh, so the example from, um, uh, that was given before from uh, Sokuncharya so is that um, Sh uh, Sherry, uh, Sherry Arnstein, she uh, kind of makes a, a, you know, a taxonomy of the types of participation that we have. And some of them are very superficial, like uh, just consulting the, the, the citizens. The ideal, would be to co-design with citizens, right? Co-design is really great because then you are incorporating other kinds of knowledge in your design and you are understanding things that you wouldn't be able to understand otherwise, especially, uh, for example, just an example, don't be offended, by, but men are <laughs> designing most of our cities, but uh, half of the population of the world is women. So. Uh, we need to have more women uh, designing cities because they know uh, how they want to live and they know, uh, yeah, what is what does it mean to be a woman in a very unsafe city, for example, right? Uh, okay. Uh, 
any more questions? Is there ways to deal with spatial injustice or a theoretical level? Yes, we are trying to do that with this course. Um, lots of input in the chat. I'm uh, getting another form of spatial injustice occurs when public space is managed by the private sector. Oh, totally, which is more common, right? which can prevent people from using that same space. A ruling, a ruling the private space would be the solution for it to be fair. Is that enough? Caroline, what do you think? <laughs> well, can, can um, Angelica, can you explain what you mean with ruling the private agents? Uh, hello, good night. Uh, good evening. Uh, what I mean, it was, is, is that enough just making rules for the private sector or it's not enough? It, we will not have ever uh, enough rules for them to provide a fairer space or a fairer space, a just mm -hmm. space. Well, I, I think rules are, are important. I think poli politics ha have a, um, an also their sort of uh, obligations or how shall I say their um, responsibility. Um, if, if you look at the political system, at, let's say a democratic system where people have elected uh, their, their politicians, it's a representation of those, uh, of all those people and not only a representation of those who are rich and, and vocal so I think politicians have the obligation to make rules that allow all people to, to flourish. So um, it is part of the solution, but it, it's, it's only part. I think also in, in, just in, in education, in, in a lot of uh, different, let's call it sectors, um, this, these ideas of, of fairness and justice needs to, um, needs to be uh, get more attention. And I think if you look at what is happening at the international uh, uh, level with uh, UN agencies and, and the, like the new urban agenda or the SDGs, for me that, that is really important because it also sort of uh, shows that at a, at a world level, we, we are aware that justice and fairness and the end of poverty and so on are really the things that we need to, to, to uh, aim for. And although people at the local level might, might think that is far away, it's, it's not, it's being translated, it, it trickles down. People, uh, that there are countries and, and, and continents signing, if the Europe uh, agrees with the document, it's translated into European legislation, which is then translated uh, down. So, um, I think we need action on all different levels, not only uh, rules and legislation, but it's definitely part, an important part, I think. That would be my answer. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Carolina is asking a question, but I am going to answer uh, your question in a few moments, right? Because I, I, I'd like to give a very short presentation. Um, okay, guys. Uh, we need to go forward. So sorry if you if your question hasn't been answered yet. Uh, I, I, I'd like to just complement what uh, Caroline has said, and I'm going to share my screen now. So sorry for this. Let's see if it works. So let's talk about public goods. One way. So thanks a lot, Caroline. Uh, I see uh, people are applauding you with the with the with the little icon and uh, thanks a lot, but uh, Caroline is not going away. We are going to, to discuss more. Um, let's talk about public goods. So public goods is a way to understand how can we create some form of justice and some form of redistribution in the city. Why is that? Um, because public goods are, um, so I'm going to give you the, the technical definition of public goods, see if you understand, and then we are going to kind of give examples, okay? So a public good is a product that one individual can consume without reducing its availability. So I consume it, it doesn't decrease to another individual and from which no one is excluded. So there are two, two uh, uh, criteria. 
If I consume it, it doesn't decrease for other people and I cannot exclude anybody. Only based on this definition. Can you give me examples of, of uh, public goods? And I cannot see the chat, so you have to help me because now I'm presenting. Only based on this very complicated definition. Can you tell me? I see park, air. Uh, the seashore, uh, sea, sea beach, air. seashore. I am laser. Uh, I am taking laser. Wait, wait, wait. I, I, I can see that. I can see it now. Air, roads, sea. The air. That's very good. Allah, she has been to the to the summer school before, so maybe. <laughs> uh the ocean street lighting that's a very good one sewage water water is not always a public good i have to say sometimes um people are ex excluded from good water consumption right uh medicine in some countries that's very good mark thanks for saying that the street is a public good uh public part knowledge uh ah. That's a very interesting one, Ettore, because I think knowledge sometimes is not a public good. It depends on the country. Public education, depending, right, on the country again. Safety, Aditi, that's the one of the classic examples. Why is that? Let's try to understand public goods using safety. If I create a safe city, so look at this. Uh, let me go to my next slide. This is the city where I live in. I'm, I'm actually quite close to where this photo is uh, taken. I live very close to this forest. Like this forest is two minutes from my house. And uh, it's amazing. Like uh, I have to say, I'm so lucky to live here. I'm very, very, um, how can I put it? I'm very, very uh, privileged to live in this beautiful city called The Hague. Uh, but in this city, there was a, a state of security that was of safety that was created, right? I cannot exclude anyone from the say, uh, sense of safety because everybody is enjoying it in the city. And if I'm enjoying safety, I'm not decreasing it for other people. Does that make sense? What about freedom? Oh, that's, oh, that's such a good question. Is freedom a public good? Freedom is a right, whether it's a public good, uh, a lot of people can be excluded from freedom through violence, for example, right? Um, the, the rule of law, let's have a look at my, at my uh, examples. The rule of law is super interesting, but let's ha have a look at my example so you can see. Um, yeah, there's Alina, you are... Uh, can I just, I want to uh, say something that Ettore uh, mentioned because maybe yes, 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 it will be useful on, for on, you. On. I'm thinking of urban commons here, hence knowledge. That's actually something I wanted to bring up. Are public goods the same thing as urban commons? They are not. They're very similar and very connected, but they're not the same thing. Uh, urban commons, they are a resource that belongs to a certain community, which means that uh, people who are not in that community can be excluded. And uh, the commons, they are actually, uh, they decrease if you use them. They are a resource, right? So uh, I understand uh, why you make this connection because a lot of people actually make this connection, but they're not the same thing. Pu public goods is a little bit more generic to everybody. So I live in the city, I'm very uh, privileged. Uh, I enjoy the safety, I enjoy the beauty, I enjoy the green, these are all public goods. But as people said, and I love your answers, sewage systems in places where there is sewage systems is a public good. They're there, everybody can go to the toilet and you have to pay taxes for them but you cannot really be excluded from using the sewage, right? And they don't really decrease with the use. Um, uh, what is important to, for you to understand is that a sewage treatment plant like this one is incredibly expensive, right? So a public good is not for free. It has to be paid for. It has to be paid with tax money, for example. But once it's there, it can be used, right, by everyone. Uh, 
somebody also said, and that's very, very good, um, uh, flood defenses. Uh, uh, Desalina uh, said that. Uh, this is the London, um, the Thames um, barrier. It's there to protect London from floods, from uh, 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 you know storm surges. And once you have that in place, you cannot exclude anyone. Everybody is protected by this. So this creates a public good. I would say that maybe we can make a little bit of a distinction. This is the the uh, this is the um, infrastructure that that creates the public good, and but everybody needs to pay for the um, for this. I have heard uh, people in other countries say, "Oh, I don't want to live in Europe because you have to pay really high taxes." Well we must find a balance right if you don't pay taxes if you have if you want to pay very little taxes maybe the quality of the public goods in your area is not so good if you can't pay taxes because of a, a lot ah, there's poverty um that's another story but generally i have to say to you that governments it's not that they don't have money to do stuff there is lack of political will. Um, all right, other examples. Uh, safety, as we said. Uh, of course, uh, the policemen, they're not the public good themselves. You know, policemen are not public goods. They are people, right? But they create a public good, uh, safety, from which nobody can be excluded. Parks, we already talked about that. Um, in some countries, culture and knowledge, like somebody said, uh, in England, most museums like this one, this is the British Museum, are for free. So you can just visit them and don't have to pay, just go in like that. In the Netherlands, they are kind of expensive, the museums. You have to pay 15 euros. That's kind of a big deal, right? A lot of money. Uh, in Brazil and in many other countries in the world, this is a, a, a vaccination campaign in Brazil. And in Brazil, public health is a public good, but public health is not a public good everywhere, I have to say. Um, uh, in the United States, there is a huge debate right now about, you know, uh, about uh, the quality of, of public care. Well, there is almost none, almost no public care, and you have to pay a lot. Um, I love this uh, tweet by Sandra saying, because you know, with all these anti-vaxxers, people against the vaccine and so on, she is asking, wow, I wonder if people understand why they don't have polio anymore. Because we had massive uh, vaccination campaigns, which created the public good of a world free of polio, more or less, right? I think it's coming back. Uh, domestic garden could create a uh, public good. So it's not only the government that creates public goods. You, you as a citizen, you can also create public goods. Uh, in Europe, um, a lot of our urban landscapes are public goods because they are preserved, right? Uh, there is a huge debate about how much can we preserve? How much should we preserve? What is actually the value of this? But um, they create a public good. <clears throat> um, the landscape, and somebody said that in the chat, is a public good if we can preserve it because the land is private sometimes, but the feeling of being in the open air and looking at the horizon, somebody said the, 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 the horizon is a, is a public good is also. Caroline and I, we are looking at this slum in Brazil and we are trying to understand what are the public goods and the uh, governance of this um, of this uh, place. And we are trying to understand the commons that people have used and are using and creating by uh, self-help, right? Uh, so trying to understand what it uh, means to only count on yourself to create um, the commons, but also to create public goods. Okay, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley is saying, for years we've funded highways over public transit. 80 to 20 in the United States. Today, our public transit systems are on the brink of ruin. 
citizen states need a robust fed federal infusion of cash to protect one of our most precious public goods, and they need it now. So in the United States, there is a huge debate about how much taxes you, you should pay, but also where should the tax go, right? Uh, I, I have to say that uh, if you have been to the United States, it's a bit disappointing. Uh, the quality of their infrastructure is really crumbling. It's really unbelievable. <laughs> and you go to China nowadays, I don't know, uh, I know many people haven't been to China in this chat, but if you go to China, everything is new and uh, all the, you know, it's in kind of uh, amazing. Um, I have been to Ethiopia recently, and of course, there are public goods being created as we speak. Uh, Addis Ababa is changing amazingly fast, and the government is trying to create more public goods, right? Um, <clears throat> I is saying, we cannot accept a world in which the poor and marginalized are trampled by the rich and powerful in the stampede for vaccines. This is a global crisis. The solutions must be shared equitably as a glo global public good. So vaccines are not a public good yet. This is making fun of American infrastructure by comparing it with the uh, Moscow uh, Metro, which you know is incredibly luxurious and beautiful, while uh, some, of, well, this is a particularly bad photograph. Um, I can tell you that the subway in New York is not this bad. Uh, but uh, there are very different kinds of uh, investment, of course, also in different historical moments, right? Uh, using taxpayer money to subsidize industries because of your own policy decisions are disastrous and obscene. Our taxes are for providing public goods and supporting the vulnerable, not bailing out the government for incompetence. Okay. Um, so this is it. I just wanted to introduce this concept. And one thing that I tell my students here is that um, there is a lot to be talked about. Who creates the public goods? Is it the ro role of the government to create public goods only? Or should private enterprises also create public goods? But public goods, they don't give you profit. So how does it work, right? Um, how can we create public goods not for profit? Um, but one challenge that I make to my students is instead of starting from the design of the object, why don't you start thinking about the public goods that you want to create? Instead of, uh, so uh, because my students, they're very eager to design very quickly and they go to, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna design a bridge now. And this is going to solve the problem, right? Yes, maybe it will solve the problem. Maybe we need more infrastructure, who knows, right? But if you think, if you invert the thought and you think, okay, what is the public good that I want to create here? I want to create accessibility. Okay, maybe the, the bridge is a good, um, so are, are public goods good? I think, Public goods are amazing because nobody can be excluded from them. So they're truly, truly democratic, right? Um, public goods are not equally available to everyone, even in one city. Sometimes if you live in the center of the city, you enjoy public goods that other people who live in the periphery of that city don't enjoy. So there is a geography of the distribution of public goods, right? Uh, I'm saying that because Edgar lives in London, and obviously it depends a little bit where you live in London, you will enjoy more or less public goods. Um, that Carla is saying that's why education should be seen as a public good. Absolutely. I have no doubt education should be a public good everywhere, but it's not, is it? Everywhere. All right. Any questions or, or comments? Caroline. Edgar has a question. Edgar is raising his hand. Yes. Maybe uh, Edgar, say, say, say what you, you want to say. Oh, you like, I'm, I need to ask questions. Sorry, I'm just going to. I need to ask questions. So, my question with the public goods good is even within a city center, for example, you have a park with mm -hmm. benches, but the benches are only available for people who have a place to go to at night. 
and that when when these people leave and homeless people come there, you're like, oh, sorry, you can't be in this area. So these are people in the same context, same vicinity, but the goods are they're good, but they're, there's no there's injustice within them. Same yeah. with police and security. When it comes to like issues of racism, same city, same street, but same police. Same police because of difference in color. One person would be denied this public good. So my question then is like, is it is it? It might be good, but it might also be like injustice at the same. Time. Absolutely, you are totally right. I don't have anything to add to that. Even a police, uh, a police, uh, even safety can be racially discriminated. Um, London has this problem that a few of its parks in the central part of the city are not public, they are private. Uh, it's kind of crazy to think like that, but uh, they, it's how the city evolved. And I can imagine that there is a control of the benches. So, and a lot of uh, cities are using anti-poor design to, to, to prevent people from enjoying public goods. So that's another uh, thing just I think a, we should, yeah, go on, go on. Yeah, and ne next to that, you see that um, private initiatives are also, uh, if, if you have a, a nice uh, plush coffee corner in a park, you think, okay, wow, that's nice, let's have a coffee, but it it also creates a certain image and it, it sort of gives a certain message about who is welcome in, in that area and who is not. Yeah. So you see this totally. kind of encroachment of... Uh, small private initiatives that also impacts the use of public goods. Absolutely. So public goods, even when they are supposed to be for everyone, there are ways to discriminate people and to avoid some groups in society from enjoying those public goods. And in every uh, country that we have here represented, that's different, right? Um, I can tell you in Brazil, so. I can talk about Brazil. I see lots of Brazilians are in the room. Um, we have a problem with racism. So uh, 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 people uh, of color are discriminated in the public space. So they cannot enjoy it in the same way many times. In Rio de Janeiro, where Hugo comes from. So Hugo is, is in Rio, by the way, right now. I think Angelica, are you from Rio? Um, Porto Alegre. Ah, Porto Alegre. Okay. Uh, Hugo is in Rio, and they have this saying that the only democratic space in the city is the beach because everybody goes to the beach, right? The other spaces are a bit controlled. Any other? Uh, Any may other? I ask the question? Yes, Mariana. Uh, I know, you know, when uh, I see your Sorry, presentation, there was a Moscow Metro and I thought about the <laughs> so, so, social- It's a, it's the, a the meme, city. Huh? <laughs> Yeah, I understand. Uh, the, the cities uh, during the social period- uh, Soviet. Sorry, yeah. Soviet, yeah, Soviet period. And uh, uh, the cities, they will seem to be like uh, justice cities uh -huh. because uh, and I just want to ask the question, what is the difference? Because uh, the, the politic uh, was just to um, make people to do their city. There was a big green politic about the green network and transport system and uh, the willing just to give uh, uh, the room units to everyone. So mm -hmm. there was a lot of things uh, about uh, that everybody should have the uh, similar things to do, to eat, to live in and so on, yes. But uh, what is the difference now? Yes, there were uh, some totalistic things that you need to do something and all we, there was no um, injured people on the streets. Yes, there was no infrastructure for them, but uh, Mariana, you are better. You are better equipped to answer that question than I than I am, right? Because you are Russian. Uh, I I don't know. So, uh -huh. maybe I, I, you know I think, something. Uh -huh. Who maybe you know uh, this scientists who write about this because 
All things you say, they really seem to be a little bit similar. That was in USSR. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I think the US uh, from a, from an external perspective, right? So you have to forgive me all the Russians in the room because I I'm not Russian so I don't know very well, but my impression is that there was a lot of investment in public infrastructure, uh, there was good investment, uh, but there was also lack of democracy. So uh, people couldn't really say what they wanted or needed, right? So uh, all the voices were silenced and that was a little bit of a well, a big problem, I think. Um, and also, uh, we know that there was a big in inequality between the nomenclatura, the, 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 the people in power and the workers, right? So I, I think Soviet, tell me if I'm wrong, because I'm not Russian, and so I don't know, but that's what I understand. Um, so somebody is saying, well, so, you know, public goods are not as good as you're uh, saying, Roberto. Well, the concept of public good is really good. We have to really uh, struggle, fight for them to be truly public because they're not in many places, right? I think what uh, has changed very quickly, Mariana, in Russia is the, the rise of private property really super strong, right? So I don't know how to, to answer your question. So, uh, Yes, I think public goods are good. That's my position. Uh, is there a way to measure or establish a standard? Oh, the questions are coming. Uh, for good, good, good publics, good public goods, I think you mean, right? Like with public space or quantity of meters. Yes, um, into, actually there are measurements and uh, you know, that cities should have a minimum amount of green space per inhabitant, but these numerical measurements, they are full of problems because sometimes they uh, mask the reality. Um, sometimes uh, the green is concentrated and you have a, a minimum amount of green by inhabitant, but yeah, it's yeah. concentrated. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, are there people with their hands? Can I yes. say something? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Go on. Go on. Yeah, sorry. So I was I wanted to comment on the same thing about the public goods. Yes. It seems that it's very wonderful and nice, and everyone can <laughs> <laughs> can use. But in reality, I think it's very different because when it's controlled by the power or the politics, it's it wouldn't be like the same as we say because as from my experience because i'm a palestinian that lives in um, in there's a conflict between israel and palestine you know and i live in jerusalem which is the conflict of the the core of yes. this conflict so oh there's yeah. so we you were saying about the bullies so it's the police are taking side with let's say with the israeli oh my and, god yes so i and also i thought about like a very simple example about the highways. I think it's uh, a public good, but even the highways are um, designed for some, for a certain group. So- yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, uh, 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 let me uh, interrupt you there because highways are not designed for everybody, I think. Yeah. They're designed for people who have cars. Yeah. But about, uh, so Anna, Anna is going to talk about this. Uh, <laughs> oh, Anna is uh, your teacher. I She's think. my teacher, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look, um, the problem of public goods is that um, uh, generally they are, um, they are thought for, for the citizens of a country. I think what is happening in Israel is unacceptable that the Palestinians have a lesser citizenship so that's not like so even in my ID card. So even my ID card, I don't have a nationality. <laughs> I know. So it's very. So that's unacceptable because you can exclude people all the time from any public goods that you want, yeah. based uh, and uh, and uh, I mean I don't have to tell you, but uh, uh, yeah, what can I tell you? There should be a certain uh, agreement that 
public goods should be available to all citizens, but that's not ha that doesn't happen in reality. Yes. For several reasons, right? Right. And we know that. Um, and I think in your case, it's more problematic because of the issue of citizenship. I know there are Arab uh, Israelis, right, who are Palestinians with an Israeli passport. Yeah. Yes. And the rest of the uh, Palestinians. Like, like me, because I live in Israel, so I don't have the Israeli nationality. Yeah. I'm a Palestinian that lives in Israel, but in my idea, because they don't. Uh, recognize Palestine, so I don't have a nationality. Yeah, that is just <laughs> unacceptable. It's, it's ridiculous. Uh, yeah, but I'm very happy that you raised your voice because of course I presented public goods as a good thing, but they have a lot of um, problems in different parts of the world, right? I still think that we should strive and fight to create them for everybody without, um, but that's another story. That's polit politics, right? Right, uh, thank you. Look, I'm seeing a lot of stuff on the, on the chat and I lost track because there are so many comments. Would you please um, uh, tell me if you have a question? There so are some two more hands, Professor. Yeah. Ab yeah. Abderman and Elias still have their hand up. Yeah, I'm not seeing that. Ah, Abdel, Abdel Herman. Yeah, hi everyone. Hi, where are you? Um, um, the Simpsons. <laughs> no, yeah, um, you're in the Simpsons. Yeah. I'm from Jordan, and I just want to understand uh, the concept of uh, public good. So basically, the the idea of public good it has to be renewable as a as a source, and also not to exclude to exclude everyone, uh, anyone, sorry. Yeah. So I think it's simply uh, the, the concept of justice. So, yeah. uh, but on the other hand, that in case that this uh, public good uh, by discriminate, discriminatory uh, policy or something like that, so it means that it's injustice public good. So I think this is a, um, to, under, to understand the difference that we have a public good, but also we have injustice public good. We don't have justice yeah. public good. So. Yeah, uh, I think that is connected also to the uh, safety point that you were mentioning earlier, Professor, that uh, the BLM movement happened in the U.S. It's, it's completely the injustice public good of the safety concept, right? This mm -hmm. is my first point. Uh, the second point is uh, the question of, uh, about the, um, uh, yeah, the, the justice, is it a public good? And the resilience, is it a public good or is it a result of public goods. Oh, that's a very good. Uh, uh, by the way, I agree with everything you're saying. Uh, I think it's a very good point. Resilience could be seen both as a public good and as a result of having public goods. Because without, um, without public goods, uh, society, it's very difficult that a society can be resilient. Mm, yes. Uh, for example, I will give you an example. If we don't have uh, good public health, public health is a public good, could, should be a public good, but it's not in many places, right? Uh, and then you have a pandemic. What do you do with the people who cannot access medical care? Do they die? Should they be forgotten? Um, that's why in most places, uh, I know that I think in India, Maybe you have to pay uh, to get the vaccine faster, but there is also the public vaccine, for example, right? So, mm -hmm. but in most countries, uh, the vaccine is for free, right? Yeah, the because, same third. that's true. Yeah, because they want to create this public good of public health, right? Um, so, uh, Abdel, let's talk about this more, but you are totally right to, to, to think about about resilience as a public good, but it also depends on public goods to exist. Okay, so my, uh, let's go to Elias. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, yeah. Okay, thank you. I have uh, two questions about uh, the public good and uh, the spatial justice. Yes. Uh, 
the first point is in what way should we provide in the administration the public goods? Since in our case, I am from Ethiopia. In our case, most of the public goods provided by the government. So uh, most of the time, politicians use them as an advantage for their political gains. So mm. uh, creation on the provider and administrat administrator of this public goods. And the second point is about the spatial justice. Mm -hmm. uh, accessibility and distribution most commonly shared under the catchment radius, right? So for me, uh, the spatial justice seems to give emphasis on the equality perspective. For example, providing service in equal distance for normal and disabled person, like physical status, uh, it might be equal, it might be provide equality, but it's not justice, right? So how can we differentiate this? Equality, equality is not always justice. Yes, yeah, so the, I think the justice perspective that uh, you provide us was concerned about the accessibility and the distribution of uh, uh, service or any urban fabrics, right? So this accessibility and the distributions are more common on the catchment radius or provide things equally to every person or geographically accessible the way. So it's yeah, more that's the dream. equality, right? Yeah, but I, the, yeah I, I just want to emphasize that to if you only look at distribution and accessibility, that will not be enough. It's also about the processes. Maybe I didn't emphasize it well enough, but it's also of uh do do you how do processes uh, work and can they uh, lead to just outcomes and then we talked for example about participation how do you include for example people who are uh, disabled to ensure that their needs are also included and then i think there's another element that you ne need to take into account and maybe it didn't uh, i didn't mention it explicitly but it was there in um uh, more from looking at from a more injustice perspective, let's say we're talking about race and, and class, but that is the aspect of recognition and being aware that you have different groups in a society that you need to acknowledge and that you uh, trying to embrace this uh, this diversity and 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 include that in your uh, thinking and planning and designing. Um, I think the challenge is to think of people with vastly different needs from mm -hmm. our needs who need to be included in this distribution. Why are we talking about these things with you guys? Because you, most of you are architects and designers and engineers. Why do we think it's important? It's because when you are uh, working in your municipalities, when Rawan is the mayor of a Palestinian city, she will take decisions that will benefit the whole community, right? And not only uh, small parts of that community. The challenge is to make public goods truly pu public and not, as Edgar correctly points out, um, even if we have safety, safety can be selective, right? Um, depending on your race, uh, you can feel super safe and you can be uh, a victim of the police. Uh, and you can be beaten by the police, right? So uh, all these things play a role. I still think that we should strive for safety for everyone. Um, okay, guys, uh, we should have an, an activity today, but we are almost uh, done. We have 10 minutes. So I'm going to put a little example of um, something related to public goods. It's a little bit of an European, a bit of an European um, example, but you will forgive me. Just a second, guys. I'm a... So I put the link to the attendance already twice in the in the in 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 the in the link so i hope uh, i hope you guys can um can see it otherwise i'll put it again so please uh, 
let me know if you can uh, fill in the attendance list. Um, okay. Sorry, I'm a bit confused with my computer because I lost one presentation. Uh, just a second. Oh, Jesus Christ. Can I ask a question while you're looking for something? Uh, yeah, can yeah, of course, go on. So, um, Oh, it was just something we were discussing with Carissa in the chats. And I was Yes, go on, go on. And then I said, ah, you are a new liberal. Go on. So it's like how you have resilience produced by public goods. And then look, if you go into any situation, I guess all the context we're talking about now, mm -hmm. anything you study is like something that exists. You rarely like study what isn't there, right? You study the hardships or the challenges of everything that's existing. And even with these challenges that, that are existing, even if you push it like 30 years back, people would always have found something. Like I went to a certain uh, settlement in Dar es Salaam where they had a problem with water, right? Yeah. They, because the area was very waterlogged, they would just, you know, you just dig a bit of the well and the water is there. And they just had to somehow, the problem of like uh, diarrhea and all those diseases was, it, it, it had moved from their mind from being a, a big challenge to being something like, oh, we might get this disease and so we're gonna like they have taken it on as something we're gonna just deal with and we can go to a hospital like it's become something that is no longer seen as a problem because it's always there so it is a problem but it's one that they can already remedy so they're like well i expect my kids to get sick and then i'm gonna take this and they're gonna get better but if you go to a community that has never experienced this the moment that strikes it's complete like chaos so i know i understand what you're saying in the netherlands we suffer from that a lot because if we don't have a very good government that takes care of everything related to floods, this country would be below seawater, right? So uh, it, in a way it's completely not resilient, right? Uh, mm -hmm. In another way, it is resilient because it, they have money and they have organization, they have a good... I, I'm just a bit concerned because this very same uh, uh, argument sometimes is used by people who wants to say, you know, we shouldn't do anything because uh, the poor will take care of themselves. And I think that's a very uh, problematic uh, position. Yeah, so, I, think that, uh, I think it's problematic, but I think to go further, for example, if you've heard of Makoko village, how they built uh -huh. still the informal settlement that's built on top of water. So if the same thing exists in, uh, I don't know which countries in Europe where the city is, on, is floating underwater and it is seen as a, you know, ingenuity and like, you know, progress. But when these people in Makoko do it, under that view of let the poor help themselves, whatever they do is then also considered as, you know, like that is poor thinking, poor ingenuity. But from that resilience, of course, we are supposed to help, right? So from the resilience that is created from absence, we, I think, have the responsibility to step in and be like, now we're going to help. Take your whatever resilience you've created and either improve it or tell us what you did or modify it or change it or help, uh -huh. but disregarding, I think, to an extent, if you're in that state, in that village where you have, you have, you don't have infrastructure, you have created something out of nothing, and someone comes and says, you know, this is the other, that you need That's resilience. illegal, for example. Let's take yeah, it illegal, away. Or they say that this is, you know, it's, it's poverty kind of thought, like you disregard it as, we are bringing you technology. So what you've done is, is nothing. Oh, in, in that uh, sense, uh, yeah. oh yeah. I, yeah, oh, I think you are really... totally right there. We have to respect people's ingenuity and the, and the ability that they have to solve their own problems. And uh, we see that with slums in, in Africa and in Latin America that are seeing like eyesores and problems and symbols of poverty and politicians want to get rid of them, right? Uh, I don't think we should get rid of slums. We need to improve them uh, and make them better. So it's a little bit connected to, to what Rawan uh, was saying and a lot of what you were saying, um, Edgar, is that uh, a lot of public goods are created by, for minorities. So only a minority enjoys the public good when all the citizens should enjoy that public good. And then it's even more complicated because what do we do with people who are not citizens like refugees? They also have rights. Right? They have human rights and we should respect them. It's a very long discussion. 
let me just uh, finish. Uh, we have four minutes, <laughs> and I know some people want to stay and chat in the in the in in the. Um, some people just want to stay and chat with their friends, right? And I will allow you to do that. But first, I want to uh, show this example, and we can debate it a little bit. So it's a very European example. So I'm sorry for that. But you know, there is this beautiful city, uh, Oxford. Oxford is known for its you know, beautiful architecture, super historic, um, it's very rich, but there are parts of the city that are just like any other part of the of cities in England, right? They're not very incredibly historic, but they're, they're very nice places to live in. Oxford is a very nice place to live in. Well, what happens when a guy, one beautiful day, wakes up and, and says, okay, I'm gonna put a, a shark through the roof of my house. Do, does he have the right to do that? But this is a, a real story, this is real, okay? This is not a montage, it's, this exists. What do you think about this? Does he have the right to do that? Amazing, yes, yes. why not? Why not? I don't know, Inti, tell me. What do you think? Uh, is it nice? Do you like the shark? Um, I think yes. <laughs> okay. Um, can you think of, of uh, arguments why we shouldn't allow the shark to be there? I can't see the chat. Jesus. I think like he has the right to do anything he wants, but there is some borders that he has to respect because there is neighbors here in the neighborhood. So maybe they don't like the... Uh, do you say that because you think, okay, it's his house, he can do everything he wants? Yes, I don't know. Yeah, inside <laughs> his house, he can do anything. Outside, it's something like... <laughs> okay, so the shark is not outside his house. You know, I would say you no. Know. Okay, who said no? Abdel? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, like taking the kind of like visual pollution, it destroys the, the identity of the neighborhood. So this something, I don't know. It's not, I would say it's no. I mean, he's not free to do that thing. Well, um, there's somebody with their hands up. Sorry, before Abdel, there was. Uh, I lost it. Uh, I wanted to yes. say yeah. that uh, if there are no uh, like city restrictions, if it's not like uh, under historical, like uh, the dwellers shouldn't uh, keep it safe and the same uh, when it, they come here and just leave it the same, he can do some art, I think. Oh, so this is public. So you think it's uh, public art? I think when it uh, when it doesn't ruin uh, uh, the building, and when it's not a historical building, he can do like yeah. I think that it's some kind of art. Okay. Uh, okay, that's interesting. Very good, uh, Carolina. Hi, so um, from Polish perspective, I would say that, of course, he can do whatever he wants in his house. Uh, but uh, as a person who works in the Netherlands, uh, as an urban planner, <laughs> I know, <laughs> I know that um, that's not that easy. And someone could claim that the, um, he, that this person destroyed the value, which is the atmosphere or, or the climate of the street or uh, a district. Or the neighborhood. Whatever. Yeah, exactly. So he is interfering. Maybe he's interfering with the value of the other houses around. Yes, yes, ex exactly. And so uh, the his neighbors or maybe just uh, yeah, whole town can uh, yeah not gain on it on this act. Okay. So there are two perspectives, and uh, they are very valid. By the way, one is about property rights and individual freedom. I can do it's my house. I can do whatever I want. And the other explained by Carolina is that there is a public perspective that, well, you know, the house is yours, but you can't do everything you want, uh, especially on the facade, because there is, you know, the public domain. 
I know this, maybe this uh, is not a good example, guys, because it's very European. But in Europe, you can't do everything you want in your house. There are uh, rules uh, about how you have to treat your house and how the, sometimes what color you have to paint your house and so on, right? Um, what I wanted to do with this example is to say that there is no agreement, uh, immediate agreement about something is a public good or something is public art or when do I interfere with, with, um, with private uh, property rights? We have to discuss and we have to discuss and find agreements that allow us to go forward, right? And in each case, depending on each culture and also depending on the rule of law, somebody mentioned it, um, on the uh, laws and regulations of a place, you have to decide uh, based on that. Uh, actually, this exercise was a little bit more complicated and we would have to really decide based on the laws of this place if the shark would remain or not. Um, I am going to say something that is shocking, but I'm going to explain it better in, the, in one of the next uh, sessions because today we don't have time. Property rights are not the ultimate um, the ultimate. Uh, 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 benchmark for things. Sometimes property rights can be overridden by the public interest, right? So we have public rights. Okay, this house belongs to me. I can do whatever I want with it. Mm, not really. Maybe you should um, uh, think about that. This is going to be explained in detail in one of the future. Uh, we still have two, two sessions. I don't know in, in which one. Uh, I don't remember now. Uh, I just want to tell you the story of the shark. The shark was uh, built by a man who wanted to protest against nuclear power. He was angry about, oh, thanks Tariq, about nuclear power. And he thought, okay, what can I do really to call attention? And he decided to put a shark in his house, right? And there were the same debates that you guys uh, said they happened in this place. They were like, oh, okay, it's his house. No, but it's my house as well. It's interfering in the street. I don't like the shark, it's ugly. Some people raised um, security concerns. The shark could fall. Other people said that it distracted the drivers. So the drivers were like, uh, bah, right? Uh, the children loved the shark, as you can imagine. Uh, Massimos is saying your freedom ends where mind begins. And exactly, uh, individual freedom has a limitation. The individual freedoms of everybody else on this planet, right? Uh, how this story ends is that the shark remained in the city and it became the symbol of the city. It became so beloved that people go there just to see the shark and in doing so, they raise the commerce, they raise um, the taxes and so on. So the price of the houses around the shark didn't fall. It actually went up. So um, yes, the shark remained. Uh, it's a, a bit of a, a, of a stupid uh, example now I see, but um, I really wanted to just discuss this with you. Uh, for now, I want to know what you guys, uh, if you have any questions or uh, what you guys want to do, if you want to remain here, because I can give the power to someone who wants to remain, so you can chat. It reminds me of the controversy regarding placing flags behind your glass window of your house. A pride flag would be interpreted. Oh, okay. Um, the capitalist converted a protest symbol in a product. Oh, that's true as well. Okay, can I just, um, can I uh, close the session for today? I hope everybody uh, filled in the uh, attendance sheet. Did you? Thanks everyone. Thanks, Car I, I can't see Caroline maybe. Oh, she she's there, I can see her. Okay. Thanks Carissa for being <laughs> here as well. That's amazing. Thanks for helping with the chat. Guys, um, thank you so very much for being here. Uh, next session, uh, I forgot what it is. Oh my God, I'm so tired. I 25th? can't remember what it is. 
25th. Yeah. Uh, just governance. I think. Just governance. So we are going to, to talk about governance and we are going to go back to uh, what's, what's public goods and we are going to discuss even more. Okay, thanks a lot. I really enjoyed the discussion. Thanks, Caroline. I'm sorry. Thanks, Hugo. Um, can you give us the attendance uh, link? I already did. Uh, wait yeah, a minute. Hugo I'll... just it put it there. again. You it is there. Yeah. So, Hugo, just put it. Copy sorry, it Roberto. quickly. Sorry, okay. Roberto, before you go, can you define public? <laughs> public? Yeah. What do you think? What do you mean when you, you say public? There are so many interpretations, Edgar. I don't know. Uh, what do you mean? Just for the case of this public goods, because I, I think I have an idea, but I, as I'm reading the comments, I think also like with public space and, uh, you know, the uh, facade belonging to the public. So I think maybe what do you, what would you say is the public when you say it, when you use it in the context of uh, uh -huh. this? This, uh, Edgar, you said something earlier that was really interesting for me. You said, well, you have to really uh, understand uh, the thing based on reality, right? And on empirical observation of a phenomenon, right? But that's, uh, that's what we do. That's what we do. We try to understand uh, things by observing how things work in the real world. But there is another level where you start to conceptualize. So, uh, for example, uh, public goods, they are not perfect. The concept is good, but we have to kind of uh, fight to get the, the concept and be more <laughs> close to, to the ideal, right, of the public good. We know that it doesn't work like that in reality, but um, well, in some places it works a little bit more than others. And we have some good examples of really pub public goods some, in some places. So let's try to, to the same with the concept of public, I would say. Uh, there is a concept conceptualization of the public and then there is reality, right? And the conceptualization is public should be uh, all the members of a community. And I mean everybody, children, elderly, black, white, Catholic, Muslim, doesn't matter, right? We know that in reality, that's not, how it works so, uh, that's, my so short, that's my short answer yeah i totally understand you i think in my head i was figuring out public goods are goods for the public they're not necessarily goods that belong to the public like the government could own but it is for the people it's not necessarily yeah the people's goods like the people don't necessarily have to own the goods many many times they are owned by the government many times they are paid with tax money so they are very expensive actually to create and in countries where there is a little tax basis uh it's where it's more difficult to create public goods because where does the action come from mm -hmm. so that's why i am a, a big defender of taxes if they are employed correctly which they are not Okay, we can discuss. <laughs> All right, guys, shall we close? Let's talk more next time. Thanks a lot for being here today. Thanks Thank a lot. You so See you next time. Thank See you. you on the 25th. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 <laughs> I'm going to sleep now. Bye. <laughs>